so yesterday we talked about um, sort of the general overview of the nervous system. We talked about the organs, the brain, the spinal cord, the nerves, and what they do. Today we're going to focus in a little bit. We'll talk about the actual cells that make up our nervous system. Talk about them in detail. You have to know the parts of the nerve cells. Talk about it. So first off, as we talked about yesterday, the nervous system communicates using what we call nerve impulses. The nervous system sends information, and it does that using these nerve impulses. Nerve impulses use electricity and electrical current, as well as chemicals to move a message from one part of the body to another. When we think about stimulus and response, okay, the nerve impulse starts as a stimulus. There's some information coming in, and then the brain can then interpret that and send out the proper response. And it does this using individual nerve cells. And one nerve cell is called a neuron. And this is a picture of a neuron, and they look a little bit different from any other types of cells. They have this sort of branches around one side and then an elongated section. And they're able to transfer information. They can receive messages and then pass them along. So this is a nerve cell, a neuron. And this main, the largest portion of the nerve cell, that's called the cell body. And that's where the organelles, most of the organelles of the neuron are, in that cell body. And you can see, what organelle do you think that is? A nucleus. <clears throat> Any of these other parts? Around the outside, they look like sort of branches on a tree. What those parts are doing is sort of think about it as listening in for a message from something. They're called the dendrites. And there's many of them. They all branch off in these uh, various sections. And they receive information. So information comes into the nerve cell in this direction. From there, then, it passes along this elongated portion that's called the axon. And then the terminals, okay, the ends of this neuron are the terminals. So here's another diagram. This is a little more accurate. Or see, this is one neuron. You can actually see the start of another neuron over here. So here we have the dendrites, the branches are on the outside, the cell body, the nucleus. And we have the axon, long part, which ends in the terminals. What part of a, the next nerve cell are these? Synapse. No, the synapse is the space. Those are the dendrites of the next cell. So then there would be another nerve cell, it's not drawn, but over here. And then there'll be another one. And these nerve cells connect from one to the other. Okay. You can also see yeah, the blue myelin is uh, sort of like insulation. All right, so these things, what they do, the cell body is sort of the main headquarters of the cell. It contains the nucleus as well as other as well as other uh, organelles that would be in there. The dendrites, these branches, they are what can pick up a signal from another neuron or from one of the sense organs.
And the way that our nerve cells work is through this combination of electrical signals as well as chemical signals. The way that happens is chemical signals enter these dendrites. They attach to the dendrites. And then they get turned into an electrical impulse all the way to the terminal. Electricity. It's also why an electrical shock can be dangerous because it can interfere with the functioning of our nerves. <clears throat> the long part that conveys this message down is the axon that carries it from one part of the nerve cell to another. And the end of that axon is the terminal. And the terminal is the end. And then there's a gap. So the next nerve cell, the dendrites of this nerve cell, don't actually connect with the terminal. There's a space there. The name of that space, it's called a synapse. So how can the message get from the terminal to the next dendrite if there's a space? Well, it happens using some chemicals. The chemicals are called neurotransmitters. And what happens is the, the electrical signal travels all the way down the axon to the terminals. Once it gets to the end, it causes the terminals to release some chemicals, some neurotransmitters, into the synapse, the space. They then attach to the dendrites of the next one, and the process starts. An electrical signal and chemical, electrical, chemical. And that's how messages get from one part of the nervous system to another. Now you see this blue stuff here, that acts as insulation. Just like a wire in your house has a center that's metal that conducts electricity, but then it has insulation on the outside. The nerve cell has a similar sort of insulation. It helps the nerve signal move more efficiently and more quickly. Breakdown of that, um, of that or if you um, are a dancer, or if you play a musical instrument. When you practice things like that, eventually you get better and better at them, and they start to become automatic. We call that muscle memory. And one of the reasons that scientists believe that happens is because as you repeat an activity over and over, the nerves that you're using gets thicker, and it builds up. And that means nerve impulses to, to repeat that activity can happen more quickly and it becomes more automatic, and you become better at it, and you can repeat it over and over again um, without hardly thinking about it. And that's one of the reasons why we're able to do that, because we build up, as we use this, we have to practice for so, so often, or so many times to get good at something, is because you slowly build up those. All right, so again, this just shows that you know nerve impulses are transmitted from the dendrites down to the terminals happens electrically until it gets to the terminal, then to, to go through the gap for the next dendrite, it happens through chemicals. You know I have this slide, I just want to talk about it for a second. But we have different types of neurons in our body. All neurons are not the same. Some neurons are meant to bring sensory information into our body. Like the neurons that connect your ears to your brain. Those are called sensory nerves. They take the information our ears pick up and bring it into the brain where we can then integrate it. So as I'm talking right now, as the sound of my voice vibrates your eardrum, it turns those vibrations into nerve impulses, which are traveling into your brain. Inside your brain is where you make sense of it, where the sounds that I'm making, you turn them into words, and you understand what the words mean. You can think about them. All of that happens in your brain. For you to then respond to that, for example, if you're writing down your notes, then motor neurons take that information from your brain to your muscles and tell your muscles how to move and what to do. So we have this system of neurons working together and connected together that allows us to do all of the things that we do. Eric? So if we didn't have those things, Well, if your brain wasn't able to process the sounds coming out of my mouth into actual words, yeah, you, then it would just be gibberish. Yeah. 
And now an example of this is, we're going to see a little video here of a sprinter at the start of a race. So if you're a swimmer, if you've ever ran track or cross country or something, then you know, you know, you wait for, what's the starting signal? A gun. Uh, the, the gun. And so you can't start, obviously, until the gun goes off or until the buzzer goes off and swimming. And so it doesn't happen instantly. Our nervous system works very quickly, but not instantly. There is, it does take some time. For example, if you're waiting on a track event to start your race, it takes some time for that information to get into your ears, travel to your brain, you process it, and then tell your muscles to move and start running. That takes some time. Not a lot of time, but some. It's usually measured in the um, milliseconds. And so we take this into account, for example, in races. And I'll show you just an example of somebody starting a race. So what's it called if you start too early? It's false. A false start. But you can actually, if you start right when the gun goes off, is it a false start? No. It is. Okay? It's technically considered a false start. In fact, even if you start 0 0.09 seconds after the gun goes off, it's still considered a false start. How do they know? So why? Because it's... It is impossible to react that quickly. If you are able to start less than that, what were you doing? Cheating. And how would you? Your chernobyl? It doesn't have anything to do with that. It means you are trying to anticipate, and you happen to catch it correctly, and you you left early, and you got out of the gate right when the gun went off. You were just lucky. So actually, in track and official track events in the Olympics and in world track. Even if, if you start any quicker than 0.1 second, it's considered a false start. Even though you left after the gun, it's still considered a false start because you can't possibly react that quickly. That's beyond Wait, what's the, the capability. Time? What's what the time you, do you have to like start it? Be, I mean, because if you, after 0.1 seconds. Oh. And it's gonna, if you're actually hear the gun go off and then you decide you're gonna start your run, it's gonna be past 0.1 seconds. And so you have to wait for that gun to hear it and then start your race. That's uh, Asafa Powell. He's uh, one of the fastest uh, sprinters in the world. Yeah. Do they time it? Yeah, it's like all electronic. Yes. Uh, I think so. All right, the last thing we'll talk about is reflexes. So a reflex is what we call an unconscious um, reaction to a stimulus. So yeah, look, one example. If you go to the doctor, you know, and you sit on that little weird table on that paper that they put down, and you let your legs dangle over, they're going to test your, re most likely, every time you go, they test your reflex. We have different reflex that are either automatic responses that we don't really control. And they tap on below your knee. They actually tap on your patellar tendon. So your patella is your what? Kneecap. Your patellar tendon is that real thick. Um, tissue right underneath your knee that holds your kneecap in place. And if you tap on that, if the doctor taps on that, if they hit it correctly, it triggers a reflex where what happens to your leg? It just sort of goes out. It doesn't like kick out at a thousand miles per hour, but it, your, your muscle slightly contracts and it goes forward. And what happens? Do you think about it? You don't control it? That's a reflex. And what that means is in your knee, when they tap on your patellar tendon, it goes through a neuron to your spinal cord. And then that neuron is connected to the muscles in your hamstring. This, this doesn't go to your brain. It just happens, goes out to your spinal cord, directly back to the muscle. And so you don't, same thing happens if you touch, for example, if there's a, a the burner on the stove is hot, if you touch it, What's, what happens? You, you do get burned, but before no, wait, wait, it hurts, you pull it away. You don't feel, oh, this is really hot, ow, oh, that hurts, and then you pull away your hand, right? <laughs> what happens? Uh -oh. It's just automatic. 
And the reason it happens so quickly and it happens before you actually feel the pain is because it's a reflex. What happens is you touch that, you touch that hot burner. The sensory neuron brings that information to your spinal cord and then directly back out to your arm muscles, causing you to pull it away. Before that, me that message doesn't go all the way up to your brain and be processed and then back down telling you to move. So that's why it happens so quickly. And again, you pull your hand away, but it doesn't hurt for a little bit of time, right? Then all of a sudden it starts hurting because then that information is going to your brain and those pain receptors are sending that information. But you take it away before you ever feel the pain. And that's a good thing because that's a reflex. If, it, if you had to wait to process that and then take your hand away, then you would do much more damage when you got a burn. Mm -hmm. But that reflex allows you to take it away quickly so that you minimize how much damage you do to your, to your skin. So that's